So starting with today, we're going to think about a few methods where we're not predicting something. So we're just going to uh, be looking at a data set, but we're not going to have a corresponding Y that we are predicting. So we're only going to be looking at some data sex set represented as X. Um, and uh, in particular, what we're going to talk about this lesson is when we have many, many variables. And um, we've seen this once before, but generally we've focused on cases in which we have a relatively large number of observations as compared to variables. So n being greater than p. <clears throat> but there's two other extremes that are really important, and especially for biological data, when we can make these really widespread global measurements nowadays. Um, one of those is when we have many observations and many variables. And another one is when we have many variables, but few observations where P is greater than N. <clears throat> um, and the techniques that we're going to talk about in this lesson are going to help with actually all of these cases, but are going to be especially helpful for the bottom two. Usually, when we're dealing with a whole bunch of different variables, we don't really have a great understanding of how they relate to each other. For example, if gene X is high, we might, you know, for some reason, think that gene Y might be high too, um, but we're probably not sure. <clears throat> but if we had these relationships, we could reduce down the data that we have to something that's smaller. So, for example, if we had a data set where we were thinking about um, you know, some sort of set of observations in Los Angeles, <clears throat> and we had a variable, so a column that represented the time in Los Angeles, and then we had a variable that represented whether or not it was daytime. Um, if it's 3 p.m. in Los Angeles, it should be daytime. And so we don't actually need to store both those things. We could simplify this down, make our data set simpler, and this is going to come with some benefits if we can do this. So um, broadly, the, the techniques we're going to talk about in this lesson are called data reduction. We're going to reduce down our data and um, try to do that in a way that preserves the stuff that we care about and potentially gets rid of some sort of information in our data that we don't care about. Unlike supervised methods where we actually are trying to predict something, we're not going to have a great way of determining whether or not we're successful here. So it's not as though we can do cross-validation and see, is this working? There are things that are sort of like that in unsupervised methods, um, such as this, but really the, the only way that we're going to be able to determine whether this is useful is if um, it ends up being useful for our particular purpose. And that can be a lot of different things. So we're not going to be thinking about prediction at this point. Um, but these sort of data reduction methods are going to have relationships to a lot of, um, or provide a lot of other benefits. So for one, they're going to just purely compress down the data. That can be an important benefit. If you have a 10 gigabyte file and you wanted to send it to someone, you probably want a way that you can compress it down. It's going to help with visualizing the data, and that's going to be a really nice benefit of um, this first method. Um, if we find a way to compress down the data that is appropriate for our data, that matches the sort of patterns in the data, then potentially we'll end up with better measurements. If you think about maybe we have, you know, um, well, actually, you know how you might do an experiment a couple times and then you average that because the average of that is going to be a better estimate of the true information. The same thing is going to happen here. If we match those patterns, we'll be able to get rid of noise and be able to um, be more confident in a particular prediction. And potentially, it's going to be easier for us to interpret our data. So especially with biological data, often we don't just want to have a black box prediction. We actually care about why we got a prediction, and compressing down our data is going to help us be able to figure that out. And a nice bonus is that 
a lot of the methods in this class can be used after this data reduction step. And so this is something you'll often see as a first step before you apply some other method like regression um, or some of the methods we'll talk about after this. <clears throat> So um, both of the methods we're going to talk about in this lesson come down to matrix factorization. And this is actually a really, really, really common theme that dimensionality reduction or reducing down our data set um, often relies on some idea of how the structure of the data can be broken into smaller matrices. And the, the basic idea of all of these methods, regardless of how they're structured, is that they're going to find two matrices who product, whose product best approximates the original matrix. So if we think about it right here, we're going to have some X, which is our original data. And then we're going to uh, factor that into a W and an H matrix. Those can be a varying size. Um, but if this is going to be useful, those are going to be smaller, but still able to estimate the um, data that's present in X. And the, the effect of this is going to be that this, this W matrix and the H matrix are roughly going to correspond to the effects of a particular data point being in a row or how the observations are different and, and the effect of a data point being in the column or how the variables relate to one another. And that's pretty easy to see if we look at how matrix multiplication works. Matrix multiplication tells us this, that if we have a, a W and an H matrix, <clears throat> that the W matrix is going to be affecting the rows. If we move A1 up, what it's going to do is it's going to increase the value of the entire row in our output, in our estimate of x. Um, if we move b1 up, it's going to increase the values of all of uh, the column, the first column in this matrix. Um, and so the effect of doing this matrix factorization is that we're going to separate out how the rows are related to each other and how the columns are related to each other. Now, we have actual data. We don't just have rows and columns. And so um, this is going to relate to our data in a particular way. So if we have a matrix where we have these features and samples, um, then we're going to end up with a matrix that corresponds to the various features and tells us how those features are related to each other. And then we'll end up with another matrix that relates to the samples um, and how those are related to each other. And you'll find lots of different names for this. Um, we'll talk about the names that are commonly used for <clears throat> um, principal components analysis, which is the, the first method we'll take a look at. Um, but these are often called things like the dictionary or the patterns or the explanatory variables. These are all terms for um, how the variables are related to each other. And then um, we'll see that the samples, that matrix is often referred to as um, the scores or the re regression or the reduced space. Um, but the important thing to keep in mind is that one of these relates to the rows and the other one relates to the columns. And this is a, this is a generalization of um, a whole bunch of different methods from linear algebra. So we'll in fact see that um, doing this factorization in the first way we look at is going to be roughly equivalent to um, doing the SVD factorization of a matrix. <laughs> so there's going to be quite a bit of linear algebra um, in this lesson. Okay, so um, let's think about this though. We have, we take an X and we turn it into a W and an H matrix. And in our X matrix, well, in our W and H matrix, um, 
in our W and H matrix, uh, the M is going to be defined by X and N is going to be defined by X. But the inner portion of our matrices, so the, the reduction part, R, um, is something that we can change. And let's say um, we decide to make R as um, be just as big as our matrix was. So let's say we start with an X, and this is an N by N matrix. And we end up factoring this to a W and an H matrix. And both of these then are also N by N and N by N. Okay, so this isn't gonna be super useful because we've gone from N squared numbers in our matrix and we've actually made our data set bigger. So now we have two N squared numbers. So um, we've actually just made more values to take to keep track of. Um, and But what this can tell us though, is that if we're taking an X and we're making it even more numbers, clearly it should be possible to um, exactly reproduce X. And in fact, we can see that by saying, okay, we'll factor X into the identity matrix and uh, times X. And that's clearly just gonna be X. And so therefore, we can always determine an R, so a number of components, that's what we're gonna to refer to this R as. Um, we can always find an R that'll exactly reproduce X. Let's think about another extreme. Um, and we'll call this the best case because it's gonna be the case under which we reduce the data down the maximal amount possible. So let's say that R is equal to one. In this case, we're gonna take X and we're gonna factor it into just two vectors. So we'll have W times H. And we go from N squared. We're gonna just assume that X is has the same number of variables and observations for now. And that's gonna to go to N numbers and N numbers. Um, so let's think about if N is equal to 100. So we started with a data set that has 10,000 values in it. And we've reduced it down to have 200 values in it. So this will be great if we can do that. Um, if we can reduce down 10,000 values to 200, we've made our data set uh, a whole lot smaller. Um, and everything in between is possible. So what we can say about this is that um, so long as we have more than say one variable in our data set, we should be able to reduce down the data set. We may not keep all of the patterns in X, we might end up breaking some stuff. Um, but that one extreme exists. And then at the other extreme, we can always add enough components to be able to exactly reproduce the data that we started with. Um, and so this is encouraging. It means that we can choose between these extremes. Um, and these are the two properties that we're, cho we're waiting between. So I keep saying compression, that matrix factorization is compression. Um, and that's actually a little unusual way of thinking about these data reduction methods. Um, most often the idea that they are compression themselves isn't brought up as much. Um, but I wanna show that because I think it visually really uh, effectively um, shows what these methods are doing. Um, so here's, a, you know, we have a picture of a cute cat um, and we're gonna take this image and then we're going to um, reduce it down by principal components analysis. Um, and this is using a very small number of components. I think it's something like three or four. Um, so this makes the, the data set, you know, the image uh, just a hugely smaller. Um, but what you can see is you do get some general patterns. Like if we look back here, you can see that generally the middle of the image is more orangish and we're still seeing that pattern in this um, compressed image um, by matrix factorization. Um, the, the other thing I think this really shows amazingly well is that uh, when we do this factorization, we're looking for patterns that correspond to effects across the rows or effects across the columns. So for example, you can see that there's streaking vertical streaking here, 
You can also find horizontal streaks in the data. And that's because what this factorization is going to do is look for patterns in those dimensions. And by adding those up um, during the matrix multi multiplication process, it then starts to estimate um, any sort of pattern in the data. So let's add a few more components. Um, this is actually showing a number of components that compresses the image to about 1% of where it started. So it's compressing it a whole lot, but you can see that even now we can make out the cat perfectly. There's some artifacts in the background, but overall the image looks really good, um, even though we've compressed it down a lot. So um, data reduction is going to be equivalent to compressing down our data, but that's exactly what we want to do. And that also means we're never going to exactly perfectly um, represent our data, that we're going to lose some information here, but that's exactly what we want to do. We want to lose information that we don't care about and keep the stuff that we do care about. So as some examples just from more biologically related information, let's say, um, you know, you have a, um, you're doing um, some various batches where you're making a protein and you have all these automated ways of measuring all the properties of that system. So maybe you measure 60 different properties of your bioreactor, like uh, temperature over time, um, the levels of oxygen, the levels of lots of different nutrients. And you want to understand the overall patterns in that data. Um, we're not very good at looking in 60 dimensional space. And so using some sort of data reduction like this might let us say, OK, this is how the different patterns are related to one another. And this is how each run of the bioreactor is related to one another. So um, what these methods are going to let you do is be able to see these patterns across those two dimensions that you care about. Um, and you might look for, say, which runs were uh, more different than any other run. And we're going to be able to look at that after this data reduction. One example that we're going to see um, when we look at this in a, a slightly different form in the, the next uh, module is that um, these methods can be really uh, incredibly neat in um, identifying mutational processes. So if you say measure all of the mutations in a cancer cell and you do that across lots of cancer cells, you can ask, OK, what are the mutation patterns that look similar? Um, and which cancers show similar mutation patterns? Again, we have this row versus column effect. Um, and then these data reduction methods are used all the time nowadays, especially in more complicated forms. Um, because we get these just incredibly big data sets. Um, and one place that these comes from is in um, single cell methods, where you might measure gene expression in thousands of cells. You then have a thousand cells by, say, 20,000 genes. That's just an incredibly large data set. And there's no way that anyone could just look through the raw numbers there. And so these methods can help you to start seeing the patterns, say, how cells are related to each other, or how genes are related to each other, um, when it would just be impossible to look at the overall data set before that reduction step. And these reduction steps are, I want you to think about them in their geometric form, um, because although they are matrix factorization, um, you should remember from linear algebra that matrices are really just ways of doing linear transformations in space. Um, and so we're going to think about these um, pretty graphically initially, and then start to think about the math details. OK, so the first method we're going to see is an application of matrix factorization. Um, and matrix factorization can take lots of different forms. And so we're going to have to define a couple rules. And that's going to um, end up giving us uh, principal components analysis. So in principal components analysis, each principal component is going to be one of those R vectors. Um, we're going to say that it has to be uncorrelated um, with the other principal components. So it has to be orthogonal to the other principal components. It's ordered um, from the principal components that capture the most variance to the least variance. Um, 
And it's going to reduce down the dimensionality while prioritizing that it captures the maximum variance in the data set. So it's um, going to prioritize patterns where there's a lot of variation. And those rules are then going to give us principal components. So in just matrix factorization, generally, what we had is we're going to say T x w and this is equivalent to saying x is equal to t w t the letters that are used are going to vary um, but in this case what we have is x is our starting data um, and then we're going to have a this is going to be called a scores matrix and this is going to be called a loadings matrix. So scores and loadings. <clears throat> and the scores are going to relate to the rows of X. Um, you can see, like when we were looking at this earlier, that the first matrix in this multiplication is the one that relates to the rows in X. Um, and the, <clears throat> the loadings are going to relate to how the variables are related to one another. Um, and I like to think about matrices by drawing out little representations of them. So let's say we have a big data set. Um, in this case, you know, X is large in both dimensions and we have two principal components. So R is gonna be equal to two. What that means is that um, we're gonna have two columns in our scores matrix and two columns in this loadings matrix. Um, and that's what's going to be able to estimate this X. So that's the first step is this is, this principal components is exactly equivalent to factoring a matrix into two separate matrices that are overall smaller if we're doing this well. Okay, so let's think about this then visually. What I'm gonna do is we're gonna imagine we have a data set with two variables. So it has some x1 and x2. And we're gonna do this on two dimensions because it's a lot easier to visualize two dimensions than say 40 dimensions. But the same process is gonna happen if we had more dimensions. And we have sort of a cloud of data points here. And we're going to think about two special data points. So we're going to have this A here and B here. So let's first First, we're going to figure out our loadings, the, um, the directions of the principal components. Um, and this is how actually some of the processes by which you solve for PCA are going to do their work. Um, so the, the, one of the properties of principal components analysis was that the principal components are ordered in terms of how much uh, variance they explain. And so when we start to think about principal component one, what we can do is observe, okay, most of the variation in the data is along this dimension. Um, and so if we recognize that, then we can say, okay, this is principal component one. Um, and then the next thing we know about principal components analysis is that each principal component is orthogonal to each other. So as soon as we find this first principal component one, something we can do is just subtract off the effect of this. And that's equivalent to projecting all of these points back onto the line. Or it's equivalent to subtracting off um, that uh, variation after you've projected onto the line. So what's ever left. And so by definition, the second principal component is orthogonal to PC1. And so we end up with PC2 pointed in this direction. Okay, and now we've, um, we've solved for our principal components analysis. Um, 
Now, one of the common things to do with principal components analysis is to plot these two principal components. So let's, um, we're gonna move from a graph of the actual raw data to a plot of the principal components. So instead of having x1 and x2, we're gonna have principal component one and principal component two. And this is gonna be a scores matrix because we're gonna think about the position of points in this space. Um, and then after that, I will make a loadings matrix. And something I wanna mention at this point is we're gonna center this data. So it's all gonna be centered around zero. So we're gonna have zero here and zero there. Okay, so we have these uh, principal components and I'm gonna put zero in the center of these two. Um, and let's think about where A and B are here. So these principal components are just the same as a normal axis. So if we think about A, A is located positively on PC1 and negatively along PC2. So when I go to my principal components plot, if I wanna ask where A is, it's gonna be positive on PC1 and negative on PC2. So it's gonna be somewhere like right here. Now, where is B? B is positive on PC1 and positive on PC2. So we can say positive on PC1 and positive on PC2, and that's where we'll find B. Okay, so now let's do our loadings matrix. The way to think about the loadings matrix is what direction does each principal component point in? And actually there's directionality to this. So I'm gonna say that PC1 points in this direction and PC2 points in this direction. So principal component one points positively with respect to X1 and positively with respect to x2. And so we're gonna find, uh, the way to think about this is where is x1 located on the loadings plot? PC2 is negative on x1 and positive on x2. Well, sorry, so x1 is um, positive on PC1 and negative on PC2. So positive on PC1, negative on PC2. So we'll find X1 over here. Um, X2 is positive on PC1 and positive on PC2. So we'll find X2 up here. Okay, so now we've put together visually um, how we can represent this principal component space. And it's a space because it's purely a new set of axes. So we've taken this um, complicated data and we can do something like look at where the data points are in this new axis space. And we can also ask how the variables are placed inside of this principal component space. And it's, it's a little unclear when we're just looking at a 2D example, but what's really important about this is let's say we had a data set that had X1, X2, X3, X4, X5, X6. We would still be able to make a plot of that just the same. We, if we added new variables on here, they would affect the principal components analysis but we would still just end up with additional points on our loadings plot. So principal components analysis gives us a way to visualize data where we otherwise, it would be impossible for us to plot it. Finally, I wanna think about um, how these plots end up represented in the matrices that we get. 
So if we have this A and B, this is the score, so it's going to be in our T matrix. And remember, this is going to have two principal components and two values in it. So, and I'm just going to, rather than think about the actual value here, I'm just going to think about the sign um, to make this a little bit easier. So the, the way to think about this is that the columns in this are going to be each principal component. So we first will think about um, PC1. And PC1 is going to have A, which is going to be negative. Or, sorry, both points are going to be positive with respect to PC1. So we're going to end up with 1 and 1. And then with PC2, A is going to be negative and B is going to be positive. And so um, this is how this will be represented in our matrix and how it corresponds to this plot. So I drew additional points here, but I'm still just going to do uh, the two x1 and x2. Uh, the loadings matrix is also going to have columns that represent each principal component. Because remember, we took the transform of it when we did the multiplication so that we can represent it in this common way. And uh, PC1 is going to be positive on both x1 and x2. So we have positive 1, positive 1. PC2 is going to be negative on x1 and positive on x2. And so that's what our loadings matrix is going to look like. And this is our W. OK, so I want to go through two mathematical ways of solving for principal components analysis. And the reason for this is not so much so that you can you know, prove principal components analysis yourself, but so that um, you have all the tools available to you um, to, to understand intuitively how principal components works. So the first common way, and this is generally used for smaller data sets, so this um, can be more difficult to use if you have an incredibly large data set, is to use singular value decomposition. And what SVD is, is if you take any M by N matrix, it can be represented as the product of a U matrix that's M by M, a sigma that's M by N, and a WT that's N by N. And importantly, uh, U and W are both unitary matrices, which means that W, T, W is equal to the identity matrix and U, T, U is equal to the identity matrix. And uh, what this means is that these two matrices correspond to rotation in n-dimensional space. So remember, we took uh, the plot of our data points, and then we plotted uh, new uh, axes on there. That's essentially a rotation. Like You could sort of see how if you rotated the data, you ended up on those new axes. Um, that's what these two matrices are going to do. So what SVD is showing is that any matrix can be, can be represented by a rotation rotation, a scaling, and then a rotation. Uh, PCA, we called it, we said it would look like this. And in this form, I'm not going, I'm going to define the loading so that we don't have a transform on here. Um, but it's really just the same. Um, it's a notational aspect that we're doing it this way. Let me add a note that sigma um, is a diagonal matrix. And therefore, it's scaling the values, but not rotating them. OK, so uh, we have SVD, this uh, algorithm that we can use. And we want to turn it into PCA. 
So if we take just uh, x equals x, and we multiply by w on both sides, we'll get x w on both sides. x w, this ends up being our loadings. And we can replace this other x with the SVD. So u sigma wt w. And then we know from the property of a unitary matrix that WTW is equal to the identity matrix. So this disappears. And then this ends up being our scores matrix. And I'll come back to this sigma in just a second. Uh, so this shows that um, if we have the SVD decomposition of a matrix, that we have a really direct a clear way of getting the scores and loadings of our matrix. And really, that W is our loadings matrix, U is our scores matrix, and then we have this additional sigma thing. Um, so in the way that I've defined this, the scores don't necessarily have unit variance because they're, they're u, which does have unit variance, and then they're scaled by sigma. And so what this means is that uh, generally each of the columns of the loadings matrix are going to be have unit variance, um, but the scores will not have that. So if your data is scaled up, like if you just multiply all of your points by uh, two, then it's gonna double the size of all of your scores, but it's not gonna affect the loadings at all. Um, but in practice, the where the scaling ends up affecting your data can be implementation specific. So some software packages may return this sigma um, multiplied in with the loadings. And so, um, Don't assume that uh, either the loadings or the scores will be perfectly unit variants. Um, however, one thing we can do is if we z-score all of our data so that all of our data has unit variants, we use this for um, with regularization methods, then we know that the sigma that we end up with is going to be equal to identity because the sigma is our scaling factor and we're saying that if we z-score all of our scaling is going to be equal to one and so the scaling isn't going to have any effect so commonly um, principal components analysis um, you will scale all of your data anyway because you want to have all the variables on a similar scale and the effect of this will be that you no longer really need to worry about the scaling factor that this will just disappear Okay, so again, SVD is a common way to calculate your principal components analysis um, when you are looking at a data set that's of modest size. So I, I'm just going to show this um, as an alternative, and this is for uh, larger data sets, um, but uh, Again, this is mostly so that you have a better understanding of how principal components works. Um, you won't get asked about exactly how this works, but I think this mathematically shows a nice property that we know about principal components analysis and actually uses it to solve for the solution. So again, remember, if we have our data set like this, our first principal components is in the direction of maximal variation. And then any subsequent principal component is uh, based on whatever's left over after we've corrected for this. So you subtract off the contribution of principal component one, and then the um, remaining difference from this line is what ends up being part of principal component two, three, four, et cetera. So another way of calculating for your principal components is to take an iterative approach. Um, and what this does is it says, okay, we're going to just look at principal component one. Um, and uh, we're going to think about just the loadings matrix. 
Um, and so the loadings matrix for just one principal component is going to be a vector. And what we can say is, OK, we're going to wiggle our arrow around that represents principal component one. We're going to keep that arrow, so the loadings of principal component one um, unit scaled. And we're going to look for the direction of our arrow. So the, this is going to correspond. Uh, we're going to look for the direction of our arrow that maximally explains the variation in our data. Um, and the variation explained is um, the projection down onto the line. And so this expression is equivalent to saying that um, we're going to move our arrow around until we identify an, a direction in our data that maximizes the variance explained. A final step of this is it's generally pretty hard to for us to just perfectly constrain that w, the, the uh, magnitude of this vector is equal to 1. And so what we can do is we can normalize this out by adding w to the top and the bottom. Um, and this gives us a quantity that then we can maximize. So we can use this and maximize w without worrying about the magnitude of that. So um, again, this takes a property of principal components analysis, that the principal component should be in the direction of maximal variation, and that subsequent principal components should be orthogonal to one another, and turns it into a way of calculating the answer. So wiggle an arrow around until you get the direction of maximal variation, and then you can subtract off all of that variation and move on to the next principal component. Okay, so we went through a method of SVD, uh, the method we just talked about is uh, this iterative computation. Um, and so if you have a ton of variables, this can be a really effective way in calculating the principal components. Um, and there, there's a more complicated generalization of this iterative approach called NIPALS. And we won't go through that method, um, but this is also a common way of calculating um, the principal components. Okay, so um, you've got all the tools now to apply principal components analysis. Um, I want to go through, lastly, just a couple properties of principal components um, so that you um, have these in mind. So something that we didn't really quite talk about too much is that um, at one extreme, you have just a single principal component, you explain some of the variation, but not a lot. And then at the other extreme, you can perfectly reconstruct x, but that's not really useful for us. So how do you pick the number of principal components? There's no solution for that. Um, it really depends on what you want to do. But a common way is to look at a quantity called R2x. And what this is, is the uh, percent of the variation in x that is explained by your principal components. So the way to calculate this would be 1 minus the variance in the difference between your reconstructed x and your original x divided by the variance in x. And so if we think about this, this quantity is going to start at 0. Because if uh, our principal components are nothing, then um, you're just going to have the variance of x over the variance of x, and you're going to take 1 minus 1, and that's equal to 0. At the other extreme, this is going to be equal to 1, because if we perfectly reconstruct x, there's going to be no variance, so we take 1 minus 0. And what you commonly see with principal components analysis is that a couple principal components explain a ton of the variation in your data, and then you end up with some sort of elbow. And this is a common reason to use R2x plots because um, you can look for where you go from explaining a lot of the variation in your data to having principal components that are probably redundant. Another nice property of principal components analysis is that PC1 goes through 
Principle component one goes through the multivariate mean of your data. Um, so if you take an average in lots of dimensions, it goes right through that mean. Um, and it minimizes the sum of squared error. So principle component one is a lot like a um, ordinary least squares estimate of your data. Like if you took a line of good fit through multiple dimensions, that's what principal component one is. Again, principal components are by definition orthogonal, which means that you're gonna end up with variables that aren't super correlated with one another. Um, and that, has some, that can have some really nice properties. And then remember principal components, if you have three principal components, those are the principal components that explain the maximum amount of variation in your data. So you can do no better than those um, with any sort of linear analysis. With that, um, this is a really nice tool to be able to visualize your data again. It can get rid of noise if it's set up appropriately. So you can actually get better information um, if uh, you have a good match between PCA and the structure of your data. Um, and it reduces things down. And one really nice benefit of that is it often makes it a lot easier to visualize data where you have lots of variables.